It's Solving Your Driver Problem, where we break down real solutions to help you with driver marketing, recruiting, compliance, training, and retention. Today, we've got Avatar Management Services and Avatar Fleet CEO, Mark Gardner, who's been studying the entry-level driver training rule. So the challenge of the day, getting those new folks in the industry. Mark Gardner, good morning. How are you? Good morning, and thanks for having me on the show today. I appreciate it. All right. I know you've been rolling around in the rules and regulations, so we're going to get right into it, telling people what they need to know and what they don't. So let's start with uh, what the ELDT, another alphabet suit by our government looking out for us. What is it? It is ELDT is a short uh, acronym for entry level driver training. It's uh, legislation and rulemaking that's been in the works for over 15 years. Uh, actually, two years ago, it came very close to a launch in February of 2019, no, 2020, uh, and then it was scuttled for a couple of years because the government didn't have their act together and couldn't actually operate all the necessary software that was needed to make this happen. So when's this thing actually going to go live? Th they claim it's going to happen on February the 7th, 2022, and there's no backing away from that. Federal Motor Carrier Safety uh administration has confirmed as recently as last week that this is a go forward action on february 7th so let's break it down is this relevant for me if i'm hiring people out of school or only if i'm helping them get their cdl it is primarily for those who are coming out of a minivan or a sedan and becoming a cdl driver and it's going to make a seismic shift in the way that many companies and certainly all truck driver training schools operate today. Uh, the, the changes are monumental in some ways. Uh, the legislation is uh, it, it's well-intentioned. They, they always want to come up with ways to make the world safer. And I have been a, a very vocal critic for many years of the federal government's rulemaking because I believe rules don't really control behavior. And so rules really don't make a big dent in safety. But in this instant case, I, I applaud them. Uh, there are some weaknesses and shortcomings. But in this case, I do applaud them because they're putting together regulations for the first time ever that say, you know, before we put a guy behind the wheel of a 80,000 pound rig, maybe he ought to have some kind of training. And maybe that training ought to be delivered by somebody who knows what the hell they're doing. And so in that regard, I do applaud it. And I'm looking forward to its impact on the industry over time. So how will this change the routine for those of us uh, helping people get their CDLs? Okay, today, and for the last since 1987, when the original CDL legislation went into effect, uh, today, uh, an, an applicant whether he goes or she goes to a truck driver training school or gets hired on by a school bus company or a motor coach company or even a trucking company, they go down to the license bureau and they take a written test. The written test consists of 50 questions. And for many years, they struggled with that written test. We developed a CDL program years ago that actually taught to the test, included all the questions from the test, and therefore we got high pass rates. But they would get a, a, a license to drive and to learn. So it was a permit, basically, just like when you're a 16 year old, you get a uh, temporary permit to learn from your parents. Uh, they, they modeled the same routine for professional drivers where a person could get a CDL permit and then start to train. Remarkably, and this blows my mind, this is part of the flaw in the, in the legislation. Remarkably, the government's decided you don't need a permit anymore. You're going to go to the truck driver training school, and on day one, with a driver's license, you can drive a tractor trailer out on the street. On day one at the school bus company, you can start training in a school bus right out on the street with your license, just a passenger car license. And they have merged together the written test, which used to be bifurcated. It was by itself to make sure that you at least had some basic knowledge first. They have mushed that together with the skills-based portion of CDL uh, evaluations. And so today, what you'll do is you'll go to a certified, EL, a certified uh, training center, <clears throat> and more on that in a moment, and there they will work with you for both the knowledge and the skills pieces that you need. And when you're finally through their curricula, whatever it may be, they'll send you down to the license bureau where you will get your entire CDL all in one fell swoop. So you said more on that in a minute. How if... How do I get my training program uh, certified? Well, 
if you are perchance a, a CDL, let's say you're a CDL truck driver training school, you have to go to the Federal Motor Carriers uh, site and you have to apply and you have to meet certain requirements. You have to re meet requirements for your trainers, for your facilities, for your vehicles, for your curriculum that you're going to teach. And you have to have documentation and evaluations all documented for three years for everybody that goes through your program, whether they pass or fail. Now, this is a self, mm, self certification, if you will. You could lie and you could just put information as, yep, I've got 15 years of experience, but sooner or later they will come and get you because the, uh, the feds have said they are going to audit everybody that has applied for and, and self certified through this process. Hmm. So you mentioned earlier, I just want to make sure, did I hear you say correctly, we're going to be eliminating the written test in the CDL learning permit? You know, they're unclear on the fact whether or not they're going to eliminate it, but I believe that, that we're, what they're going to do is merge it together so that when a person, let's say, goes through four or five, six weeks of training at a certified location and then goes down to get their license, I suspect there's probably going to be a written component to that testing process, but they're moot on the subject. They don't talk about it. But I can't imagine that they wouldn't at least give them some kind of a written test. But the difference is that written test now takes place after they've been driving a truck for five or six weeks, sure. not before. So what does that mean if I'm a regular passenger class D license? Am I allowed to operate a commercial vehicle while in training? Yes, you are. I said there were some weaknesses in this new program. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Okay. What happens to somebody who just goes to the license bureau to get a CDL? Ah, therein lies the new challenge. They will be turned away because the way the system has worked, and this is what caused the two-year delay, the license bureaus will only give a test or a CDL test to someone who has passed through a certified training facility. Let's say it's a truck driver training school. Let's say it's Bob's trucking who does his own thing and makes his own drivers. The way it works is, you are first certified as a training facility, and then you bring people in and you train them. And then you have 24 hours within their completion of that training to, to notify the local licensing bureau that they are now ready for their CDL. And so when you go to get your CDL as a person and you show up there, they're gonna look in their database and say, wait a second, Scott, you haven't been through a certified training school yet. You can't have a CDL test. And so herein lies the, the craziness is they have connected up all of the state licensing bureaus with the federal database and all of these people who are getting certified as training centers. And somehow these systems all have to talk to one another. And it will be interesting to see. <laughs> yes, it will, your government at work. It will be interesting to see what happens when Bob goes down to get his license and, oh, we don't have any information on you. <laughs> yeah. You know, those systems aren't talking to each other. Uh, that's why they delayed it for two years. It's, it's, I, I suspect it may be a boondoggle, but we'll, we'll see. Okay. So do you have any idea how the license bureau will, bureau will know the trainee is ready to take the CDL test? They apparently will have access to a database and that okay. database will be populated with the names of the people who have gone through training at a certified location as well as the name of the certified location, as well as the name of the certified trainers, who, by the way, had to have two years of commercial driving experience with a CDL of the same class, meaning if it's doubles or triples or hazmat or passenger endorsement, they have to have that, those endorsements as well before they can train you. And that extends beyond just the behind the wheel portion. That actually extends to the classroom portion. So no longer can you have a very competent facilitator teaching the classroom portion, you have to have a person that's got two years in a CDL. Mm. Mm. I'm not okay. suggesting they're not competent at classroom. What I am suggesting is that limits the number of folks who can be in the classroom teaching. Sure, sure. We see that a lot. Safety directors that either let their CDL lapse or never got one. That's correct. Um, okay, let's, while we're talking requirements here, let's go rapid fire. So minimum requirements. What are the minimum requirements for an ELDT training facility? Well, number one, the driver instructors have to have two years of a CDL, as I said, with the same class that they're teaching in for both classroom and for behind the wheel. Number two, 
your facilities have to mm, somehow be approved, but there's no data that says what the approval process is or even what it means. We are interpreting approval as to say that the facility will have at a minimum five closed course exercises or what often are called the range where you drive between the cones. The government has specified five specific ones. For years, we've had 10 to 12 different versions. Um, we have the five within the 10 that we do. And so we're pretty confident that our close course will meet muster. The vehicles, interestingly, have to be able to pass a roadside inspection, according to 394, 393. And that's going to be a difference for a lot of the truck driver training schools who use old nasty vehicles that are no longer roadworthy and say, well, the guy's on a closed course is no big deal. Today, they'll have to pass muster and they'll have to be legally uh, you know, able to pass a, a test on the road. Um, seems to me there's something else. You have to be able to maintain documentation for three years. And here's my favorite. Any written exams that are given to the trainees they have to be able to achieve at least an 80% score. But they don't mention how many questions there could be. They don't mention what the questions are about. And so literally, you could have a one question test, and it could say, did you learn anything about trucking today? And you could put yes, and you would get 100%. And therefore, you would meet the criteria of the 80% threshold. And so I, I think they, they, they went out on a limb to trust people were actually going to give a test that was meaningful and that had some content in it that was pertinent to being a truck driver or a bus driver. Uh, but they didn't specify that at all, not at all. But you got to get an 80%. All right. When it comes to driving, they're going to put the evaluation in the hands of the instructor, and they're not going to require any certain set of skills, any certain amount of time, or any certain amount of maneuvers to be done, simply the instructor says, Scott has mastered the art of being a professional driver. He's ready to take his test. Oh, and, and the trainer's got to document that, whatever that means. I think you covered it. Anything further you want to add on minimum requirements for either the behind the wheel instructor or classroom, or is it strictly oh. that two years? Well, I, I just want to comment that they, they've carved out web-based instruction or self-directed okay. learning, and they've es essentially said, if you do that, that person or whoever created that material does not have to hold a CDL license. And in our estimation, we believe that many companies and many trucking schools will actually lean more heavily on self-directed web-based learning and maybe even eliminate the classroom altogether because they can't find another CDL driver with two years of experience to go and work in the classroom as a facilitator. Oh, so I can envision keep, keep that driver on the or that instructor on the road behind the wheel, behind the wheel. That's right. I can, I can envision that they would, a lot of clients would decide, well, let's just go with the self-directed and then go straight to the yard and in, in the range. And fortunately we have designs today where we can show short one, two, three minute videos on pre-trips or air brakes or whatever out on on the tarmac with, with the guy. So forget, forget regulations from an outcomes based standpoint. What is your personal opinion on that? On that methodology on, of training eliminating, on eliminating classroom for just going online straight to behind the wheel. Um, I, I'm an old man. So I, I do like some aspects of classroom based workshops and the interactions that take place when the young pups learn from the old guys with the salty hair that, you know, I did this or that, and this kind of an event took place. But I don't think that that completely goes away. The BTW instructors will still be able to share their war stories and be able to tell those kind of anecdotes. Um, and I do think, and I have thought for 35 years, self-directed uh, learning, whether it was a laser disc, CD-ROM, or today web-based, is more effective at achieving higher levels of outcomes in a shorter period of time if and only if you have a motivated learner. So if a person is apathetic and he's in fourth grade and he's in inner city school and he has no interest in it, sure, there, there's a lot of challenges that we, we saw in the past year with distance learning or homeschooling. But an adult who wants to be a driver and get a license, by the way, theoretically would be a motivated learner. And so if you design a good course that is interactive, that allows them self-control and self-actualization, and they are motivated, I think they'll learn better and remember it longer than if they were in a classroom anyway. So at the end of that, I need to take my test and get an 80%. Can that be paper, pencil, online? Ah, they don't specify that either. I've actually got a request into FMSCSA right now to find out because 
on one hand, they're saying you can use web-based training. And on the other hand, they literally refer to it as a written test. And so I don't know. And I don't think that they've actually thought through that, but no one in the world today would hand out a piece of paper and a pencil and say, take this written test, we're going to grade it. Uh, and then we're going to keep it in your file. I think they're all going to be web-based tests. That's just the way of the world. So there's no specific subjects that they specify on the written. How about the behind the wheel? Uh, again, there's no specific skill sets. They are broadly defined. Let me clarify and back up a bit. There are broadly defined categories for knowledge and skill, but they don't get down to the micro level of a following distance or communicating a signal or anything. They're like, you need to do defensive driving or you need to have vehicle familiarization. Those, those kinds of big, you know, they're not even at the unit level. They're at the book level. <laughs> sure. Okay. The chapter level. Um, okay. So we don't really know. So how are trainees evaluated for the behind the wheel portion of their training? The answer is really cover the subjects. Uh, correct. And they leave it to the instructor to do that. We, we have structured processes that we use that guide that instructor that I think are probably going to be superior to anything that someone could cox or anything that the government actually envisioned. So I, I'm, I'm pretty sure we're covered on the documentation protocols with our instructors. And then any additional requirements for the training facilities to be approved? Again, they're moot on the subject of what that means. Our inference is that they're going to require the five closed courses or the five closed course exercises that they do mention. Got it. All right. Thank you for the rapid fire. Gardner, anything else that anyone needs to know out there on ELDT from what we know today? From what I am knowing, what I know today and from where I'm sitting right now, I think it's going to go forward. I think there's a 50-50, it's going to be a boondoggle when the guy goes down to get his license and he's not in the database. I think that a significant number of companies will probably lie and simply certify and say, yep, we're certified. And I'll have people with six months of experience being the trainers because I know that they have that today. Um, but I do know that it's going to turn several companies and some industries on its ear. School bus alone hires 100,000 people a year to be drivers. They take mom who drove the kids and dropped them off at school. And they said, let me make you into a school bus driver. This is going to be fundamentally change everything in the way they do that. Motor coach companies routinely take people off the road in a car and make them a, a driver. Bus companies do it. Um, and all, of course, all truck driver training schools are going to do it. It also affects some, not all of our clients who have trucking operations, most notably LTL carriers, who typically will have a guy on the dock. He's working, he's unloading freight every day, and then they'll put him in the yard. So he'll start backing up the trailers in and out of the docks all day long and become proficient at backing. And then they'll say, okay, let's go get you a CDL. And they'll put them through some form of a finishing school. Um, those are the clients that we have today in the truck side who will be impacted by this legislation. They'll have to sign up. They'll have to tell them well, we got two years of experience and they'll have to do all those other things. If you're a trucking company, and I'm saying trucking because they're most of the ones that are going to the schools and say using our finishing school program. What are questions I should be asking of that school to make sure that they're on top of this? Well, I think first and foremost, they're going to have to say, are you certified with the feds as a training center? And what have you submitted to them? And I want to see it. So before I take, you know, Bob's truck driver training school on face value, I'm going to say, show me the documentation that you submitted or show me your application form and show me where you have been approved because you're going to be, a, you're going to be exposed to liability. If you hire somebody from a driver training school that is not completely up to snuff and that person goes out and cream somebody, I could see that coming back to haunt you because you didn't do due diligence with your training school. That's what I was that's what I was interested at. And here it's strictly speculation because there's been no cases because it hasn't existed, but we do know plenty of attorneys are more and more aggressive. <laughs> this, uh, this is one more thing for them to go after. They're going to go love it. They're going to love it. They're going to love it. Sure. It, it's <laughs> serving it up on a plate for them. Here, have a few more lawsuits. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Would you like more, sir? <laughs> <laughs> on that happy note, I think that's the bow on it, unless you want to add one more thing. Nope. I, 
I thank you for having me here today. Like I said, once again, your government is hard at work trying to legislate safety. They only have one tool in their toolbox, and that's a great big hammer. And that big hammer is called rules. V will make rules for you. <laughs> but rules don't control behavior. And so in this instant case, ELDT is a set of rules, not necessarily to apply to a driver per se, but rather to a protocol or a process. And in that regard, I do applaud it. However, as I said, the weaknesses are glaring. You have to get an 80%, but there's no reason that, that who knows what the test is. An 80% on what? And so th th there's some big holes. And there's also the potential that mm, we're going to have a snafu with all the software requirements. Well, if the drug and alcohol clearinghouse is any foreshadowing of how the government rolls out a technology. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> It'll we'll be great. Know, it's going to go swimmingly. Well, thank you, Mr. Garner. If anybody who is not hiring CDL drivers, this is still relevant because I contend that if you're not doing it now, you're going to be doing it in the next five years, not because you want to, because you have to. Because you have that's to. Where your, that's where your drivers are coming from. Indeed. Everybody looks like Mark is is getting out of the business. And so we got to go, you got to go make your own. You can only steal them for so long. And so that's why that's the part of solving your driver problem today. We appreciate everyone for listening. And as always, we'll have ways for you to contact us if you got any specific questions to your business. So thanks again for listening, and we'll see you on the next one. Thank you.